Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this morning and your grace. Thank you for your word and that, God, it's faithful and true. We can trust in it because we can trust in you. And God, your word in you. God, you lift your word higher than your name. God, and, uh, we just love you, God. I ask you to speak to us in the Bible. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're picking up the Genesis God and Man study. And as we know, Genesis tells us how everything came to be. Uh, and it does that in just a couple of chapters. But then it begins to lay out humanity's course. It starts out with creation's course, but then it goes to humanity's course and, and God's uh, involvement with that. Uh, that even though man likes to think, he, thinks, think he's independent, or really not. Um, but again, I think it's important to read Genesis and the Bible really as it is, that it is a truthful telling of God, uh, what man needs to know. It's what we need to know. You know, some, We're going to see today, that, um, and probably next time too, that there's some other details that weren't really filled in. We don't get the details where Cain's sister comes from, or Cain's wife, whatever. She is his sister at some point. But uh, we don't get those details. But that's not important. You know, we, we can fill in those blanks based on logical reasoning but God gives us the important details you know the the personal details of these stories of these people that he's involved with and how the how he had plans for them and uh and how their decisions affected those plans for them uh, but we saw creation from above we saw creation up close in chapter two and we saw the last day in the garden in a perfect creation uh in chapter three today we're going to be in chapter four um, in the first 16 verses, and we're going to see how quickly more lives become stained with death. Um, you know, the, the enemy said, oh, you're surely not going to die. But we see that this death has ramifications um, for the rest of history. Uh, but what do you think is the best part of life? And do you think God is unfair? Perhaps you haven't experienced the best part of life where your ideal life hasn't happened yet. And do you think life is unfair because of that or because of something that has happened? But could it be that neither God nor life is unfair, but sin is unfair? And maybe it's not even unfair even. Maybe sin just clouds our judgment of what is fair or not fair by putting us and our desire at the center of the equation. Maybe we think think things are unfair because our desires and our will is what we base our determination of fair or just on. And that's not the case. We're not the center of the universe. And today we're going to read in Genesis 4, and the title of today's message is, The Lord Respected. The Lord Respected. Again, God, we just ask that, uh, God, you wouldn't respect us, but God, that you would come to us and speak to us and honor your word and uh, honor our trust and faith in your word in a way. God, that we come to you needy and empty and need you to fill us with your spirit and your word and instruct us in righteousness and truth and help us learn something today from you and uh, walk with you in, it. in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read the first five verses of Genesis 4. It says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. We'll stop there for now. It says that Adam knew Eve. And I love how the Bible puts this, that there's something much deeper about the sexual relationship between a husband and wife than I think we realize, at least as a whole. And yes, this is a polite way of saying that they had a sexual relationship, but they knew each other, and I think that's important. And the word is yada, and it reminds me of Seinfeld, yada, yada, yada. But sincerely, yeah, you get married, yada, yada, yada. You want to, <laughs> that's what happens. But there's nothing deeper than knowing your spouse mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And I think that when all these things are growing in healthy alignment, that there's really nothing like it, you know, that you're one in in all factors. And each one of those things is blessed by the other part of those things. When you're uh, emotionally together and mentally together and physically together, they all benefit each other. And it's not just 
one is better than the other. It has this multiplication to it. But what naturally happens from this knowing of each other? Well, it's kids. Unless there's some physical reason not to, some physical ailment, kids are going to happen. Um, you know, I was giving premarital advice and, you know, just to think about kids because in all likelihood, that's what's going to happen. The probability of them showing up at some point or another after knowing each other is highly likely. Uh, but this, uh, her firstborn, Eve's firstborn name is Cain. And I don't know why we call him Cain because his name in Hebrew is Cain. Cain. So it's <laughs> somewhere along the line, we really butchered uh, his name. Uh, but the Kenites come from him. Um, uh, his name means possession, uh, that he was a possession from the Lord. Uh, also, the name could mean smiths, like uh, you're a blacksmith or a silversmith. Uh, but Moses' father in law, uh, uh, was uh, a Kenite, that he came from this, this lineage, which is interesting. Obviously, that was after the flood, but there was still some tracing back there. Um, and he says, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And that's what, that's what she did. Eve acquired a man from the Lord. I would say it must have been pretty interesting for the first time in all of human history to, well, this is how a man came about. Because Adam came from the dust, God breathed in him. Eve came from Adam's rib. God personally made each of them, but not with this firstborn. Cain was the firstborn, in a sense, over all humanity. Uh, there's this picture there, you know, this messianic picture, in a sense, that Jesus was firstborn over all creation and over all sin. He was the first to raise from the dead, and God had promised the Messiah would come through Eve. So perhaps they were thinking this was the promise, that they would get back already to the garden and to that good state right away. You know, they trusted in God's promise. You know, Psalm 127, 3 through 5 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. You know that you get an army out of kids, but you get joy out of them. That you're happy when you're kids, when you have kids, when you're young. When you're older, it's harder. When you're young, it's great. And they get to grow up, you get to aim them, and they get to... Uh, you know, you always want the best for them. This is this verse talks about wanting the best for them. They are the rulers of the city. Uh, they are the leaders. But today being Father's Day, you know, and my kids, a beautiful wife, making me some sweet Father's Day gifts yesterday. You know, they really are the best gifts from God. You know, Ash and I have always thought, you and I have always thought of our children as gifts from God on loan to us um, for caring, to give back to Him daily, eternally. Uh, obviously better and well off guided towards him that when we're all said and done and at the end of our days we can say God we we raised them up until the day we died uh, towards you and, and that's our goal but you know I think sometimes we have to be reminded to give them back sometimes sometimes things are going really hard and we feel like it's it's our responsibility and it is but we need to give it to God for wisdom and how to do that but also sometimes things are so good and you forget that they're the Lord's and you just want to hold them tight forever um, but they're all a blessing, and I love them no matter what. And do you know that that's God's heart for us, is that we're his children. We're gifts to him. He loves us no matter what we do. Right, Alicia? Right? And no matter what we call ourselves, how much money we spend to try and change ourselves, um, we're always his, and his mind is always best for us. And perhaps, you know, like I said, there were also some thoughts of Messiah complex here. He obviously wasn't. Uh, but again, you know, maybe he had this Messiah complex going on that he could do no wrong. Maybe, you know, we'll see his attitude later on. But it says here that, uh, uh, that Eve had a second son. Adam and Eve had a second son. His name was Abel. And again, I don't know how he got Abel because in Hebrew it's Hevel. So we've really butchered these names. Cain and Hevel. But I'll say Cain and Abel because it's, it's easier. But, you know, why on earth we change your names? But his name means breath. You know, it's interesting we're not told why. Perhaps he took their breath away. <gasps> Another son. You know, perhaps it took him a little bit while, a little while to breathe. You know, I remember when Mia was born, she didn't breathe right away. And I was a little, uh, a little worried. But it's interesting that the reference is that his brother. You know, the reference is based on birth order. The significance of being firstborn was big in many cultures and still is today that it wasn't just oh their second son but it was Abel Cain's brother you know that Cain was the firstborn and now we brought in Abel his brother into the world 
I think it naturally works that way too. You know, Mia sometimes would give her responsibility. I think naturally she has it built it in as a firstborn to look over her siblings and to care for them, and she does that. And Jacob, sometimes I think we have to remember he's not as old as her. We need to treat him accordingly, um, and because he is special, just like everyone, else, just like they all are special. But he's not a middle child, so to speak, to not get lost in there. But he, the way he looks up to her, you know, the way he copies the things that she says, because she is the firstborn. But also the way he cares for Alicia, you know, that he's got, uh, he's not firstborn, but he's got that older brother in him that loves his little sister and cares for his little sister. Uh, and he plays with her differently than he does with Mia. And Alicia, you know, she's the baby, but, you know, they were all babies. You know, we can't baby her forever, but uh, she she's going to look up to them naturally because they're God-given as her older brother and sister. I think a family resemblance, you know, my brother, sister, and I don't always look alike and put pictures next to each other, but there are resemblances, you know, in your family and our kids and cousins, they have different resemblances there, you know, maybe they had a resemblance, maybe, you know, they were like two peas in a pod, they were a couple years apart, or maybe nine months apart, God bless you, Eve, but, you know, they were, she's like, oh, I can't catch my breath, maybe that's what, maybe that's what it means, I don't know, <laughs> but we're not told of the other siblings yet. Perhaps we're just told of the male ones here. You know, obviously there is a male culture, at least, and the male ones were important to this story that God wants to walk us through. And I think even in our own families, I don't, I don't even know if that's a male or female thing necessarily, uh, but we tend to know the dramatic stories, the famed family member or the bad family member. I mean, maybe they didn't tell these stories till after this happened. Uh, you know, but I think the normal kids tend to slip by without infamy sometimes. We hear about the bad kids. We hear about the really good kids, but we don't hear about... The kid who got straight B's through high school and worked a job and never got in trouble, you know? You know, we hear about the valedictorian or the black sheep. And they get all the attention. And uh, my sister-in-law, Jennifer, was a sal salutatorian <laughs> in high school. Uh, I think in college or something, too. But I joked her. I was like, oh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, because it's like she did awesome. But it's like you get overshadowed by those, you know, who tend to take all the glory. But we're not told here how much time passes. We're told of their both of their births. Perhaps they were close, like I said, being his brother. Uh, you know, but I wonder what the back of Adam and Eve's minivan looked like. How many kid stickers did they put on there? Um, you know, because uh, we're just told of their births, and then what they do is adults. Maybe they're teenagers, maybe young adults. They weren't married yet. You know, at least they were told of because Cain doesn't marry until later. Uh, but we're not told of the sisters or the females in the culture a lot. You know, maybe had an, Eve had enough infamy for them all, they didn't want to tell any more female stories. You know, he was like, you know, uh, let's not get in the book like mom's in the book, you know. Maybe they learned a little bit, right? But Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. You know, I think being the firstborn, maybe he was doing what Adam did. Although perhaps Adam had animals too. But God prescribed Adam originally to be the gardener, the one to take care. And when even the curse was, Adam, you're going to have to sweat now to get food out of the ground. And maybe Cain followed in those footsteps. You know, but there aren't Geico cavemen. We've all been taught, we continue to be taught. They didn't go in caves. Right away, we were, we were not hunter-gatherers. We were domesticated. We were farming. We were doing agriculture and animal husbandry right away. Um, you know, I know how good a movie Encino Man is, but it's all fantasy. Right, Lisha? Again, we're not told how much time passes here. We'll see that later. There are obviously other people born during this time. You know, people lived hundreds and hundreds of years until after the flood when, the, when God decreases man's age. But there's a lot of time to know your spouse. You know, what else are you going to do anyway? There's no movie theater. There's no mini golf. There's no restaurants. You know, having kids is pretty much what you're going to do, you know. And God commanded them to do so anyway, to be fruitful and to multiply. And I think that a lot of times um, obeying the fruitful part of the relationship is easy. But we don't want to take the responsibility of multiplying. Um, but it really is multiplication. You know, we were talking about our differences in our kids. It's not just one kid and another kid. We thought we had both sides of the equation. We have a third kid. We realized, no, this is multiplication. It's it's not just one plus one plus one. It's these kids are multiplied of, of our uh, uh, traits, but also God's gifts and calling in their life. We see that it multiplies in our family. You know, I think that's what a healthy relationship does. It's not one plus one. It's you know, we encourage each other. We build each other up. Isn't the church supposed to do that? The church is supposed to grow and multiply because we're not just adding to each other, but we're building each other up, and that's multiplication. 
uh, you know, and all the fun we have, you know, it, it really does multiply when we begin to laugh, it, it multiplies. Uh, but back to Cayenne and Havel, and I had to write that down because it, you know, it's so ingrained in us to say it another way, but when the time was full, ready, or the time of the offering perhaps, maybe it was harvest time, maybe the season changed, that's when they brought an offering to the Lord and said, Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground, and Abel brought firstborn and fat of the flock. The difference there is that he brought a real sacrifice. Cain brought an offering. Nothing wrong with an offering, but in a sense. But here, this is not the prescribed way. It needs to be a sacrifice. And Cain tried to bring what Adam might have brought, perhaps, when he met God before sin. Maybe when Adam and God walked in the garden, maybe Adam would pick some fruit and some stuff that he found and bring it for a snack. I don't know. I'm just thinking here. But sin changed things. Sin changed things where uh, just a, a fun offering was not the first thing that's going to happen. It's got to be sacrificed, and God made the example for that. When he killed an animal and covered them, or several animals, and covered Adam and Eve. You know, God did not respect it, and that word means to gaze, to look on. You know, when when uh, Cain brought his offering, God didn't even see it, in a sense. You know, it didn't catch God's eye. It's not something God would look at, you know. The Bible is very clear that God looks on Jesus instead of our sin. And we want God to, to look, on, look on that sacrifice and not look on what, what we've brought in our own strength. You know, 1 Samuel 16, 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And God knew Cain's heart. We're going to see that. It's very clear God knew Cain's heart uh, from the beginning. He knew Abel's heart as well. And it's interesting that Abel, that he chose, or maybe he was bent towards shepherding as his career, that he didn't do um, uh, farming, you know. He was a shepherd, and he brought an animal sacrifice. Maybe he made that connection to what uh, his parents told him about what happened in the garden and what God did. Maybe he made that connection. Maybe it was, you know, someone's got to keep the sacrifice going. You know, maybe that may, someone's got to have animals. If we're going to have sacrifices, if we're going to remember God and show that we're repentant, you know, maybe he was, in that sense, that calling of being a priest, that calling of being um, a high priest for his family. The Bible doesn't say that specifically, but perhaps that was in his heart. Perhaps that's what he was like, man, someone's got to be the sacrifice. Someone's got to prepare the sacrifice for the Lord and for our family. And uh, and even if it wasn't that deep, if it was just he recognized that this is what he had and he needed to bring the best of what he had, you know. And if they're brothers and they're close and they're hanging out, Cain could have easily said, hey, you know, Abel, I'll give you 15 squash for a, a good lamb. Sure, you know. Or, hey, Abel, can we go together on this, you know. But there wasn't. There wasn't, you know, I think Abel thought if, if God sacrificed for me, I should sacrifice the best for him. I think that that should be a heart for the Lord, that what he did for us, there's nothing that we should not be willing to sacrifice for him. Uh, the significance of the firstborn was not lost to Abel's mind. You know, he brought the, the firstborn of his flock, the best of his flock and the fat of it. You know, it reminds me of Jacob and Esau as far as respect unto the birthright. Jacob being the younger, but he understood the power of the birthright, while Esau, you know, didn't really care. He sold it. And, you know, obviously, I think Abel's a better picture than Jacob is at this point, but, um, you know, I think that they both understood that, being the younger brother. And I think this echoes the offerings also outlined in Levitical law later on. You know, it's the fat of animals, it's the firstborn, it's without blemish, it's etc. You know, it's the, it's the best things. I think all these are pictures of Jesus' sacrifice. He was the first one of creation, like we said. He's God's only begotten son. He's the best, the sweetest, the most flavorful offering uh, to give to God. But God respected Abel's sacrifice, and he looked on it. You know, just as he looks on Jesus and not on us. You know, Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all an unclean thing, like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. You know, I think Cain said, I'm bringing you my righteousness, God. Look at all the great stuff I made. I brought up out of the earth, you know. But Isaiah goes on, he says, We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And what, did, what was Cain's reaction? He was very angry. He was hot. He was furious. The word can be incensed. And I think if instead of his offering be a sweet aroma of incense to God, like it says the prayers of the saints are, the smell of his anger reached God's nostrils. You know, he said, uh, James 1, 19 through 22, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, 
slow to speak, slow to the wrath, for the wrath of the man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And I think, don't we tend to get angry when we put our faith in our own efforts, and those efforts go unnoticed, or don't give the promotion we expected? Maybe it's in our relationships, or in our job, or even spiritually. I've been doing all this for this long, God, and I'm not a whatever yet. Well, there's your heart. There's your heart in it. You know, I think it's a very good test for our motives is our reaction to God's reaction or others' reaction to what we've sacrificed or offered up. But let's go on. Let's read verse 6 through 15. It says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and his desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And Cain said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me is going to kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. You know, I like how God gets right to the point again. He says, Why are you angry? I, I'm injecting a little New York attitude here, but seriously, seriously, Cain, seriously, why are you angry? You know, I think God was trying to make him look at his situation, his reaction, like, Cain, why are you angry? You know, did you do what's the right thing to do? Did you do what the right sacrifice was? Did you bring that to me like it's it was outlined by how I lived and how I did it for your parents? Why are you angry? You didn't do what you're supposed to do. You know, you know, it, it was written all over his face. You know, it was written all over Cain's face. So like when our kids get angry, it's like written all over their face, you know. And we say busted, you know. And, and uh, you know, when they're really not angry, it comes out of them. But God lays it out for Cain just how simple it is and how fair of an equation it is. He says, Cain, why are you angry? If you do the right thing, isn't it going to be accepted? You know, it's it's... It's not that hard to do the right thing. You know, obedience, like I've said to Jacob and the kids, like, obedience really is not that hard. Like, yeah, I mean, you don't want to do it, but in the long run, it's easy. And there's always a blessing at the end of it. You know, disobedience, that's hard. Being in timeout, being scolded, losing privileges, that's hard. But God says, if you do the right thing, am I not going to give you the right reward? You know, it's that simple. You know, why are you playing by different rules, Cain? Why are you making up your own rules for... These spiritual things, Cain, doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. And I think God's not trying to be unfair. God's not trying to be mean, but it's like, it just doesn't work. It's like A plus, you know, one plus two equals three. You know, you can't just start mixing things up and expecting it to work. If I go put apple juice in the car, the car's not going to run. You know, it's going to ruin the car. It's just, if, Tim, if you just put gas in it, wouldn't it have been fine once you've saved yourself all this trouble? I think sometimes we don't realize that, that it's just simple, you know? And God even outlines in a possible, positive way, the other side is like, and simply, you know, if you don't do well, if you don't, not like if you do wrong, but if you don't do well, if you don't do the right thing, the good thing, the best thing, Cain, sin's waiting for you. Sin's right outside the door, Cain. Like, it's not that far away. It, it's, you know, is the door even locked? Have you opened the door? Are you going out there to see what's there? It's desirous for you, but Cain, you should... Rule over it, God says. You should rule over it. And I think both morally in the sense of it being the right thing to do, like Cain, you should do it. It's the right thing to do, boy. But also, I think, in the most logical sense, like with me, Cain, you should be able to rule over sin. 
with a relationship with me, sin should be no problem for you anymore, Cain. It should be easy. Go get an animal, sacrifice it, done deal. It's over with. I've made the way. I've made it easy for you. I've prescribed it. I've outlined it. I've done it. I've given you the example. I'm even here to meet with you. Even when you did the wrong thing, I'm still going to talk to you. Even when you're angry, I'm still going to respond to you. So why is it so difficult for you, Cain? Be careful. Sin is going to destroy you. It's at the door. It's not even like, you know, down the street. You don't have to go looking for it. It's looking for you, Cain, and it wants to rule over you, but you should rule over it. And it's interesting that Cain doesn't respond to God here. He goes to talk to his brother, and I don't think he's doing Matthew 5, 23 through 24, that says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way, and first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I don't think Cain's, I, I know, that wasn't Cain's intent here. You know, and I think God was giving him opportunity for this even. But he did it interesting. He says, uh, to, to say, to speak, to utter, uh, is this to go speak to his brother, to say in one's heart, to think, to command, to promise, to intend, uh, to boast, to act proudly, even to avow. You know, it's like, you know, hey, you know, I don't know, I don't know the conversation that happened. I don't know what they said. There's probably a couple ways you could look at it, but perhaps he was like, hey, Abel, you know, let's go look at my field and I'll show you how good it is. You know, said, sure, brother, I'd love to see all the things that, you know, God is blessing you with. Yeah, I'd love to see that. You know, I'll come check out your crops, you know. But this land can mean that. It can mean cultivated land. Or it can also mean land of beasts, like a wilderness or the mountain. You know, maybe he said, hey, Abel, you know, hey, hey, brother, we need to talk. Will you come on a walk with me today? Come talk. Sure, let's go. I'll go with you. You know, and when they get out there, you know, there's no talk. There's no talk. Uh, sin rules over Cain, and he kills his brother. They're in the wilderness. I think Cain, in his mind, said, I'm going to take Abel out in the wilderness, where no one's going to see what I'm going to do. No one's going to know what happened to him. You know, it's kind of like Joseph's brothers. They weren't where they were supposed to be, and they decided to, to kill Joseph. And thankfully, his brother got in the way and prevented them from killing him. But, um, you know, I can I can hear, uh, again, the serpent's word in the garden, echoing, you'll not surely die as Cain's killing Abel, as his blood is spilling over the ground. You know, this is very bloody. You know, this is... This is a hateful, vengeful killing. I don't think that it was just a, a polite little poisoning. It was probably brutal. You know, you think of you know serial killers. They love these to like torture their victims, and they they bury their bodies out in where no one they think no one will find it, or you know maybe they leave clues because they want to be discovered because they're so proud of it. You know, I saw a video the other day of this serial killer. They busted, and it was like. Um, their interrogation of him, and he's like, you guys will be proud of me, the way I reloaded and did all this other stuff, and it's like, just absolute, like, still thrilled about it, he's sitting in front of the police, arrested, he's like, this is, you know, like, there are sick people out there, you know, and they're they're twisted from sin, it's scary, they could be at the gas station, you don't even know, you know, but again, there's no talk when they get out there, there's no talk, you know, you will not surely die, but your kids will. And I think parents' sin, I know, parents' sin has a huge effect on their children. I think they're the ones who bear the real weight of it, the real consequences, the children. Yeah, you know, I think it gets multiplied on them. Just like children are the multiplication of the parents. Parents' sin multiplies on the kid, you know. A drunk parent maybe deals with a, head, a hangover, a headache, maybe a ticket, maybe just a little embarrassment or they're sorry. But what was that child left with? They're altered. They've seen their parents messed up. Maybe their parents said something or did something to them that's going to affect them for the rest of their life. It's going to affect their, their emotions, their relationships, their interactions, their decisions. You know, oh, you know, maybe dad used to, so maybe it doesn't even, you know, affect them consciously. Maybe they go out and they begin drinking because that's all they know, or they have a violent relationship because that's all they knew. And you think of the next generation taking it farther, like we were talking about yesterday, you know, the last generation being so morally corrupt, and now their children are taking that base of morally corrupt and multiplying it even further, and the morally corrupt parents are outraged at how morally corrupt their children are. But what do you expect when you throw away all moral judgment? When you throw away the doing the well for doing it your own way, what do you expect to come out of your children? And it's sad, and the enemy knows this. You don't think the enemy knows this? The enemy's been around since the beginning. He knows exactly what to do to get to the children, you know. 
And that's what he's wanted to do since the beginning because he knows that the children are going to be the ones who come back to get him and get revenge on him for what he did to their parents. It wasn't Adam and Eve who got revenge on the serpent. It was Eve's children who would be the ones to do that. Next generation takes it farther. And I pray our generation, our next generation, takes the faith farther than we take it. That they multiply it and they go out farther than us. That they get launched farther than us. And that their lives are more successful spiritually than ours. And I pray that ours are as spiritually successful as they can be. But. but then it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, You know, how long after did God confront him right there? Did he just finish burying the body? Did he just get the blood off his hands, perhaps? You know, it reminds me of right after Adam and Eve sinned, they realized they were naked, they began to cover themselves, and it says that's when God called to them. Uh, that they, you know, they, were, they ran away and hid. You know, I think Cain had just a little bit of time to get away because he thinks he can pull one over on God. He goes, how should I know? You know, in the beginning, he, he begins to shirk his firstborn responsibility of, am I my brother's keeper? Like, God, what am I, you know, it's not my responsibility. Am I, am I supposed to know what he's doing every day, the, every minute of the day, God? You know, and I think of, of that, of my brother stepping up when I was a kid. My brother stepped up when my parents got divorced. My brother stepped up and... He was a young man, and he came, and he spent a lot of time with me, and I'm, I'm happy for that. I still went off my own way, but I guarantee it would have been worse or in a different way if he hadn't stepped up the way he had, and I'm thankful for that. But again, God cuts the chase right again. You know, there's no remorse from Cain. Um, he was sold out, I think, and he was seared. You know, you think of Pharaoh. You know, God kept giving Pharaoh opportunity after opportunity, but Pharaoh kept hardening his heart, and Cain's not remorseful. Cain's like, am I his keeper? Like... I've got no responsibility over him, and you know, he did. He had responsibility over his death. And God doesn't play around with that. He says, his blood cries out to me, Cain, from the ground. There's no hiding this, Cain. The ground is telling me even that his blood is there. You know, seriously, Cain, like this is, this is no joke, buddy. I told you sin was at the door. You know, it cries out to God. You know, I think God doesn't miss a tear, and he certainly doesn't miss a drop of blood that was spilled. You know, there's life in the blood. We see that all through the scriptures that, you know, uh, I'm not going to get whack about it, but it's like you, you don't have any more blood. You're dead. You know, you need blood to live. And Jesus' blood was poured out for us. It gave us, it gave us life in a sense. You know, Revelation 6, 9 through 11 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, were completed. That even in the last days, the martyrs of the church cry out to God, and, God, and they go, how much longer, God, until you avenge our blood? Not in a self-righteous sense, but in a sense like, God, you're letting this be done to your children. We know you're righteous. We know you're just. When are you going to act? When is righteousness going to prevail here? And God robes them and says, a little while longer, until the number is complete. You know, I think of things like Planned Parenthood. The lies that they spew, the way they laugh and joke about murdered babies, the way they sell their parts on the market, and then they try and sue for the truth coming out. And the way people stand up for them and have uh, marches, and they, they talk about choice and freedom and a right. You know, do you seriously think that God doesn't hear those cries? He doesn't see that blood being spilled? doesn't see our land in our hands and our government who funds them with our tax dollars. Oh, the money doesn't go to abortions. Oh, well, maybe that's specifically that $3 out of your taxes does not go to fund for that abortion, but it frees up three other dollars for it. You don't think God doesn't see that? You don't think judgment is not coming for that? You're seriously mistaken. Seriously mistaken. I think that our judgment is coming. It's long overdue. And even if we repent, it's not going to be stopped. Because how can it be stopped when how many millions of babies have been murdered and are murdered every day? You don't think God sees that? I think God sees that. You don't think God sees heaven filling up with babies every day? He sees that. There's forgiveness for it, personally. But I think judgment is coming because of it. You know, I think even things like Starbucks. You know, I, I won't put a trip on anyone, but I, I will not go there and put money in a $5 cup of coffee knowing and how they love to uh, personally fund things like that. I know we'd have to go out of the world to escape all of that, but maybe there's other things. When God begins to prick our conscience on something, man, we need to just obey it right away. Not fund it anymore. Our hands are dirty enough. We don't need to make them any dirtier, especially for a $5 cup of coffee and where that money goes. 
Again, not to put a, a trip on anyone. But when God pricks your conscience, obey it. Obey it. Because why? Because when God does that, that means sin's at the door. God says in Proverbs 31, 8, Open your mouth for the speechless and the cause of all those who are appointed to die. And there are a lot who are appointed to die in our world. And I think none more affect God's heart more than the, than the innocent than the children are being murdered. But God says to Cain, Now you are cursed. You're cursed, Cain. You were firstborn over all men. You're a gift to your parents. You're a leader of the siblings. In a way, you're a fulfillment of what I was uh, prophesying about the Messiah coming one day. You're not the Messiah, but you're in the line. That You were in the line there. You're a leader. But you weren't accepted in faith. You tried to show your self-justification and your own placement in this role, your own self-worth. Look what I have made and I've come up with, God. I've got my own idea, like when Saul tried to do his own thing before God and he was rejected. But it was an unacceptable offering. Your offering was ignored, Cain, and I give you ample opportunity. I told you sin was at your door to be careful. And you know what? You chose this curse rather than the blessing. And you are now cursed. There's no doubt about it, Cain. You are cursed. You know, uh, Joshua 24, 13 through 15 says, I've given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build. And you dwell in them, you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose yourselves this day whom you serve. Cain chose. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. It says, you are cursed from the earth. The earth would even further be away from God showing Cain's consequence, just like his father, Adam. Adam no longer could just walk around and pick up fruit like he's at the grocery store. He had to sweat and farm to get food. But God takes that a step further with Cain, who followed in his dad's footsteps and says, Cain, because what Adam shirked his responsibility too. Cain did the same thing, but only worse. As, well, maybe, you know, it's kind of like, which is worse, bringing all sin into the world or murdering your brother? Oh, they're both pretty bad. But Cain, you're not even going to be able to farm anymore. The ground itself, because of the blood of your brother, is not going to make anything for you. You're going to have to go around and be a scavenger, eat whatever you find. Uh, you're going to be a nomad. And you're not going to have any sanctuary city to run to. We see later in Scripture, God gives sanctuary cities for murderers and things. Usually it's more of an accident and things, but... Sincerely, there's no place for Cain to go. He's got no other place to run to. And I think God could have cursed Cain from the earth by killing him, by capital punishment. And we see in Scripture, that's God's methodology. That that's says, hey, that's what's got to happen, especially in an unrepented case like this. Um, you know, that there has to be the death penalty. But God shows mercy here. I don't know why. I don't know why. You know, I can surmise a few things we'll look at, but I don't know why. I think, in a sense... The time hadn't been fulfilled yet. Like when, when Noah, we'll read about Noah in a, uh, you know, in a couple chapters, that finally, God said it's enough. All their thoughts, it wasn't just Cain, now it's everybody. And uh, God, God was sad that he made them, we'll see. But Cain wasn't repentant, you know? He doesn't say, oh God, I'm so sorry. It was my brother. What did I do to my brother? He says, this, my punishment's greater than I can bear, God. Like, give me a break. Like, th what do you, like this is what you're doing to me? Like, how much more unfair can you get, God? You didn't accept my sacrifice, and now you're treating me like this? This is ridiculous. But what about, like I said, the loss of his brother? But he cared more about the loss of his livelihood and his position. It mattered more to him. And look at how quickly we sacrifice the people we love around us when we care more about our own livelihood. What we want, what our desires are. But how about asking for forgiveness, Cain? I think God knew Cain's heart. Here, that there was no remorse. I think he knew that from the beginning. I think he knew that it was going to happen. God knows the beginning from the end. But he still gives Cain opportunity. You know, the Bible talks about God resisting the proud, but giving grace to the humble. But God's mercy is still here. I think that speaks to me that God is long-suffering. That even in a case as severe as this, God is still long-suffering. God is with those people on death row. God wants them to get saved. Yeah, they still got to pay the consequence. They still got to go to the electric chair or whatever. But God still loves them and wants to give them the opportunity to repent. You know, God's love is not above that. You know, even Hitler, if he had repented, could go to heaven. Well, that's not fair. Well, God died for everyone.
God sent his own son to die. And as awful as the things that someone like Hitler did or other or Pol Pot or these other dictators do, God's forgiveness is greater. That doesn't mean that they should ever be revered or looked up to or that they're going to have a reward in heaven, but there's the opportunity. And I don't think you did, and I'm not saying you did. I'm not saying that I would be joyful about it, but I trust in God's mercy. You know, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. And can you imagine, you know, that in every just way, God could have put Cain to death, and yet I think God still had hope for Cain. God still wanted, in some way, good for Cain. You know, in some way, it's kind of like, all right, Cain, like, you're the first guy ever. I can make an example of you, but I'd rather make an example of my mercy in you than my judgment, because God loves mercy. God brings judgment when necessary, and he loves to do so on behalf of his beloved. But he'd rather be merciful if it's possible. Cain says, I shall be hidden from your face. You know, God won't see me where I am. He still wanted God's provision and his protection, but he didn't want God in his heart. He still wanted God's hand on his life, but he didn't want to do things God's way. And isn't that us too often? You know, God bless me and my decisions, God. My desires, God, I'm going to do this. Would you bless it? You know, I'll do it and ask for forgiveness later. But when our desires fly in the face of God, we put our own loved ones to death. And now he's be wor worried about being killed. And I think that that's interesting. There's paranoia and that guilt and that unrepented sin. You know, they're out to get me, out to do what I did. His conscience is totally guilty. And I think I remember a friend as a kid, I used to always think, you know, he can't take his own medicine. He can do this to me, but I can't do it to him. And I think, you know, that's a little bit here, you know. You look at the paranoia of the left in the world today, mislabeling everyone who disagrees as some sort of evil, hateful person. It's because that's what they are. They're so afraid. They're so paranoid uh, because they're doing the wrong thing and they want it to be the right thing. You know, uh, we're coming to a close here. I apologize if it's going long. But uh, they were obviously people by this time. He was afraid that other people were going to find him and kill him. Um, you know, uh, obviously there's brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, sibling relationships. You know, incest wasn't a thing between siblings yet. Um, you know, there's a perfect gene pool. But again, you know, there's no one else. So it's like, it is what it is. Today it's messed up, but not then. But isn't that, in fact, a picture of how godly relationships, especially romantic ones, should be? Um, I'm really kind of jumping ahead as far as Cain and his wife thinking about this, but we'll get it over with now. But it's a picture of godly relationships. You know, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, and younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters, with all purity. You know, you're my bride, um, my friend, but first and foremost, you're my sister in the Lord. You know, we'll be in heaven one day together. We won't be married. We'll, we'll know that we were married, but we're not married anymore. There's no marriage in heaven. But we're forever related by his blood. You know, we won't need that marriage between each other anymore. We'll have Jesus. Um, and there's something special. Like yesterday, uh, John and Cassie getting married, about young people getting married. You know, or I think of, you know, like uh, your sister and Matt, who they were friends since they were much younger, and they dated, and they ended up getting married as adults. It's like there's something special in that, that knowing each other so long. Um, and I think I wish that was the case for everybody, not knowing anyone but our spouse. You know, thankful that we are believers and, you know, we have that. And that's kind of like a fresh start for us. Um, you know, uh, and that's the only thing that matters. But think of having that close spiritual brother-sister relationship as a foundation. And that's the important one to have. Because when that's in the right place, it's like everything else gets in the right place. You're going to treat each other right in the right way. But God, and we're almost done here. God doesn't go with Cain like he did with Adam and Eve out of the garden. God said, don't worry, I'm going to go with you, though. He says, Cain, uh, you can go away. But he does put a mark on him. I don't know. Well, it probably wasn't a cross on his forehead. I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it was like a reverse bounty. You know, and other people went to the post office. So a picture of Cain said, don't murder Cain. Sevenfold judgment will be back on you, you know. Uh, a number, seven is a number of perfection, complete, total retaliation on anyone. God's like, look, I judge Cain already. Don't you judge him. Don't you bring judgment on him. If you do that, you know, Jesus said, careful, you know, whatever judgment you mete out is going to be meted out back on you. You know, let God do the judging. And again, we don't, we don't know what that mark was, you know. We don't know what that mark of, of judgment on him was, you know. I think racists in the past have tried to say that that's where certain skin colors and stuff come from, but that's totally bogus. So it's to justify their supremacy. It's not the case, you know. Uh, besides the flood, you know, Noah had three sons, so obviously we all came from them. Uh, but this was not the intended anointing, not the intended mark on Cain. God wanted there to be, you know, God marked Jesus 
right? And no one can judge him, but he is lifted high, and we see the marks of judgment on him. Uh, but God had to put a different mark on Cain and said, hey, don't touch him. Don't touch him. You know, I think it's the same way, like when uh, Jacob wrestled with God, he touched his hip, and there was, you know, the rest of his life was marked in a way. Um, but I think in the same thing, only God judges. You know, we can inspect, we need to inspect the fruit, so to speak. But when we find God's judgment, we go no further. We're not the ones that people are supposed to sacrifice a lamb to, the fat to. We can go in and as Christians inspect other people's lives for fruit and offering, and that offering doesn't look up to snuff, then we can probably safe to say that maybe something's wrong. But we're not to judge them to condemnation. If God didn't judge Cain to condemnation, we should not judge other people to condemnation. We should come to them with hope. God hasn't taken you off the face of the earth. There's still hope for you left. I can still love you and turn to you. Now, obviously, there's different, you know, it's complicated sometimes and a way to handle situations. It's not always as straightforward as we like it to be. Um, and we're not, maybe we won't have the same relationship with anyone. Maybe they will go from our sight. We'll never see them again. But when we do meet up with them, we're not to judge them. We're not to bring judgment on them. I think Israel today uh, doesn't do God's will, per se, like the church is intended to do. They miss the boat on that one. But God's eye is still on them. And just like the scripture says, you know, hey, they're the apple of my eye. Anyone who comes against you, I'm going to come against. You know, we want to be on the side of Israel, um, you know, because there's going to be righteous retaliation on anyone who does. You know, we see that in scripture in the end times, that when the enemy tries to attack Israel, the whole enemy gets wiped out. And again, if, Cain, if God wanted Cain dead, he would have. His position was forfeited. His calling was decimated. His relationships were severed. And it was because he refused the godly sacrifice. He resented his brother who trusted in godly sacrifice. And I think I fear that we missed Abel and the picture of Abel and all of this. But Abel went home to be with the Lord. Abel did the right thing. And he was hated for it. Abel loved his brother. Abel loved God. Abel did the right thing. And his brother hated him for it. You know, a prophet's not accepted in his hometown. But sincerely, man, Abel got, Abel got the better end of the deal on this. You know, Abel went home right away. He didn't have to deal with sin for 900 more years of his life. He Went home with God. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure his heart was broken. I'm sure it was like Stephen being stoned. You know, Abel, what are you doing? You know, if, if you know, or Cain, what are you doing? I'm sure, like, if Cain didn't knock him over the back of the head, I'm sure he did, you know, I don't know what, I don't know. But if if Abel had a chance to look at Cain, I, 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 would, I would bet that Abel's like, Cain, what are you doing? Cain, you're my brother. I'm sure that, you know, that would have been the case if it wasn't just a, a cold cock, so to speak. So then Cain, um, actually, let's read verse 16. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, in the east of Eden. And we're going to pick it up here next time. But I wanted to point out that, that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He went out from the presence of the Lord. It was Cain who left God's presence in the last verse. But I think he had left it in his heart a long time ago. And maybe he was never in it. You know, maybe that's why all this was wrong. Maybe... Maybe even from a young child, he was never in it. Just because you're born into a, a spiritual family, God's family, doesn't mean that you're, you know, you got it right. And I hope that our kids pick up on that. But read a couple of verses as we close here. Matthew 5, 27 through 30 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, Jesus said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman for lust at her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish and then for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Cain, better just to get rid of that sacrifice and go get something else. You know, instead of, you know, there ended up being a blood sacrifice anyway. Cain sacrificed his brother's blood. Cain went to the extreme wrong end of the sacrificial scale and ended up spilling his brother's blood. And that's the thing. When we don't come to God with a sacrifice of his blood, blood's going to be spilled. You know, blood is going to be spilled one way or the other. Uh, and we really want it to be God's way and God's blood that's spilled. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, James 1.12 says, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Uh, then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. 
You know, God wants us to rule over sin. God wanted Cain to rule over sin. God wants us to rule over sin. And whatever he wants us to sacrifice to rule over sin, we need to give it up. We need to turn from it. We need to do the right thing. We need to do well. Is it not easy, in a sense, to do well? Yeah, our fleshly desires make it hard, and temptation makes it hard sometimes. But God's reward is guaranteed, and God wants to go through it with us. And in fact, God's already provided the sacrifice for us uh, to accomplish that. So let's do well. Amen? Uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for this picture of Cain and Abel and of you and this uh, tragic uh, circumstance. Um, God, we thank you for mercy. We thank you for instruction and correction before sin comes. How often do you meet us? Uh, when we're close to sin and you say, hey, watch out, help us listen, help us heed, change our hearts, God. We, uh, we ask for your forgiveness for our sin of the things in our hearts that maybe we haven't done or said, but we thought or felt and uh, dwelt on maybe. Help us not to do those and God, to not sin against you in our hearts and others and to love you and be with those in our lives who are under your judgment, have faced your judgment, but don't have your forgiveness, God. God, help us be ministers of forgiveness to them, God. Uh, for your sake, and uh, and with a loving and uh, servant heart, we ask God in Jesus' name. Amen.